And around the same time, a very thematically similar idea was published by Donald Schluter, who was who used looking at morphology, um, said if you have two traits and you look at the pattern of variation within a population with respect to those traits, the traits may be correlated with one another in such a way that the pattern of variation forms an, an ellipse. Okay, it shows that there's some correlation between those traits. And the major axis of this ellipse, which he called the G-max, as you might know, um, and it is, is along here. And, and simple selection theory uh, tells you that the most likely direction of evolution under genetic drift or natural selection would be along this line, because that is the line of greatest genetic variation. There could be some deviation, there could be, um, there could be evolution toward an optimum which is different from that line, and that would happen only to the extent that there is not a perfect correlation, correlation between these two traits. But if the traits are correlated, it can take quite a long time to reach an optimum which is at a very great distance from this G-max line, the line of greatest genetic variation and greatest response. And so he said, that um, it would take more time for populations to adapt to an optimum that was only slightly deviant, or that they take more time to reach a very highly deviant optimum compared to a very slightly deviant optimum like this one. And he presented some evidence that that was the case with, uh, with birds and, uh, and mice and fish, um, just a little bit of data for each. And since then, some other uh, investigators have done a similar kind of analysis um, and found the same thing. Here, for example, is Gene Hunt analyzing a species of Ostracoda in the fossil record. And he finds that the amount of deviation from the line of greatest, very, greatest uh, uh, phenotypic variation um, that the, uh, that, uh, that I mean, I, evolving far away from that line, it takes a longer time on average than to evolve just a short, a short way from that line. So there are several lines of evidence that there may be genetic constraints on the direction and rate at which evolution can take place. Um, there are a number of other examples that I cannot go into, um, but I will just refer you to two very interesting papers. One is in Ecology in, 19, in 2005 by Blows and Hoffman. Uh, which uh, summarizes evidence for genetic limitations on evolution. And the other is a more theoretical paper by Walsh and Rose in the Annual Review of Ecology, Evolution, and Systematics um, in 2009. And both, of, and both of these papers summarize reasons to think that there may indeed be an important role for genetic constraints in evolution. In other words, to at least some extent, Steve Gould and other people who were thinking in, in these terms were right. Um, Gould probably exaggerated, but nonetheless, there was at least, I think, a, a very strong element of, of uh, reality in what he was suggesting. Of course, to the extent that there are genetic constraints on adaptation, this has immense consequences, doesn't it? If every, popu if every population of organism had abundant genetic variation for temperature tolerances and drought tolerance and so forth, we would not be as worried about the consequences of global climate change as we are. We are worried about that because we do not expect populations of organisms to instant, almost instantly evolve a new adaptation to highly divergent environmental conditions. It may well be that some of the major questions in ecology are in part dependent on an understanding of genetic constraints on evolution. For instance, why are there more species for many clades of organisms? Why are there more tropical species than temperate zone species? And one suggestion is very simply that it has been difficult to adapt to the climate of the temperate zones. Most of the has evolved in a tropical environment, the tropical climate, which at one time embraced most of the Earth. Um, and so ancestors were adapted to a tropical kind of climate. And adaptation to a cold climate, a climate with breathing, freezing, may be very difficult. There may be genetic constraints in many lineages that are only occasionally broken. And here, for example, is a study by my colleague John Williams and collaborators showing that in the 
drug and the Ely day, the tree frogs, there are only about three invasions of the temperate zone. And furthermore, that the number of species in any given region, and defined climatically, is correlated with the amount of time that the clays have been in that region, based on a molecular uh, assessment of divergence times. Um, I think that in the interest of time, because I've already used most of my time, I think that I will um, uh, only very briefly mention uh, the, the issue of genes as followers versus um, as leaders in evolution. Um, and I really don't have to have, have the time really to go into this in detail. Um, these, these, in, in various, the, the ideas here are various versions of the, of the Baldwin effect. Uh, which was uh, summarized by Simpson in 1953 as follows, that individual organisms produce non-hereditary modifications, which are often advantageous. So we, we, our skin becomes more melanized when we are in the sun, and perhaps that protects us from ultraviolet light. Second, there exist in the population genetic factors that produce similar effects. And according to the Baldwin effect, these genetic factors are favored by natural selection, perhaps, and the what had been a non-hereditary modification of the phenotype becomes hereditary. Simpson uh, said that he thought this was fully plausible, but he, he said also that there appeared to be little basis for viewing that it is a frequent and important element of adaptation. More recently, my friend, at least I hope she is still my friend, Mary Jane West Everhart, um, has uh, advanced this point of view in a very striking, very striking language. Um, she says that most phenotypic evolution begins with environmentally initiated phenotypic change. The leading event is a phenotypic change with sometimes extensive effects on development. Gene frequency change follows as a response to the developmental change. So most adaptive evolution is an accommodation of developmental phenotypic change, and genes are followers, not necessarily leaders in phenotypic evolution. But I think this is a rather, uh, perhaps, uh, extreme uh, statement to the Baldwin effect. Um, and I've been trying to think of what does this mean, and um, should we view this as a major, is this, is this true, and is it a major challenge to traditional theory? Um, I can only think about this in terms of reaction norms. And of course, the reaction norm is the phenotype, Z, the phenotype that a particular genotype expresses under different environmental conditions. And so a plastic genotype is one which exhibits different phenotypic states depending on the environments that, uh, that trigger the, the development of those states. A genotype which shows no alteration of the phenotype, no matter what the environment, is said to be highly cameloid. And of course, you can have cases where there's a threshold response to a change in environment. What would genetic assimilation be? Well, it would be that um, you had an ancestral reaction norm with which expressed different trait values, different phenotypes, depending on the environment. And then one of those phenotypic states becomes fixed, becomes catalyzed, um, so it becomes essentially totally inherited, okay? completely fixed by, 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 by genes, no matter what the environment. So that, I think, would represent extreme genetic assimilation. This is a figure taken from a, um, a paper in the NAS in 2010 by Stolville and Fender, uh, and I may mention that paper again. Um, well, there's a, no one doubts, there isn't any geneticist, any evolutionary biologist in the world who doubts that these reaction norms can evolve. Because within a population, even if the mean reaction norm is shown as, by this, this uh, brown line, for example, different genotypes will have slightly different or perhaps quite different reaction norms. And we're always looking at the average of the mean reaction norm. And to the extent that there is then genetic variation in the reaction norm, Obviously, there could be evolution of the phenotypic response to environmental conditions. They become greater, more canalized, or more plastic, either way. So what would a Baldwin effect sort of thing look like? Well, I can envision two extreme cases. 
In one case, you have an ancestral reaction yarn shown here by red within an environmental range that is also shown here by red. And there's some genetic variation around that reaction yarn. And um, under a new environmental condition, let's say it's, it's a greater temperature, um, why some of these genotypes are simply capable of extending their normal reaction norm in just in, in extrapolating under the new conditions. And it might well be that the optimum phenotype in this new environment is here, and indeed the optimum is reached simply by extrapolating from a pre-established developmental response to the environment. And we have to ask, how did that developmental response to the environment come to exist in the first place? The other possibility, of course, is here's the ancestral reaction norm, here are the reaction norms of some individual genotypes in the population. Um, the, um, there's, a new, you know, there's a new environment, and perhaps most of the genotypes have a reaction norm which are, would extend into the new environment here, but maybe the optimum is down here. And in that case, there would have to be selection on some genotype that happened to have a reaction norm which was reasonably close to the optimum. So this would be a somewhat different case in which there is novelty arising by virtue of selection on random genetic variation and reaction norms. So I'm not sure what Mary Jane was to regard as thinking about it in this kind of framework, but I think she's probably thinking most of the time about this kind of an extension of a reaction norm. Um, and there are certainly examples of that. Um, here is one um, from the same paper that I just referred to, and that is a species of Daphnia, a small crustaceola uh, crustacean that lives in lakes high in the mountains in North America. In the ancestral type um, is black, and it produces melanin, black pigment, if there is high ultraviolet, and produces less melanin if there is no ultraviolet. The melanin, of course, is protective against the ultraviolet light. But in some of those lakes, trout, lupa, have been introduced. They, of course, are very great enemies of the daphnia. And so a black daphnia is very easily seen and very easily eaten. So there has been strong selection against any daphnia which can become black, even if there is ultraviolet light. And the consequence has been the evolution of a more catalyzed reaction norm so that there is no, no, almost no melanin produced whether the environment uh, it has ultraviolet or not. Um, so this is, if you like, a simple catalyzation of a pre-existing reaction norm, a part, a curtailment, an abridgment, a shortening of part of the ancestral reaction norm. And my question then is, where did that ancestral reaction norm come from? Well, a very traditional theory of the operation of natural selection on genetic variation. And I would be very interested to know if there are important examples, convincing examples, of, uh, in which there is some reason to think that there is some major uh, challenge to the traditional theory of natural selection on genetic variation. Because at this point, I am skeptical. So to conclude, um, I've treated um, uh, three, uh, three issues that are 